I'm Mike Siddall, so I'm the project manager for EcoEye Northwest here at the University of Cumbria. So EcoEye Northwest is a, a, a collaborative project with six university partners all working together to provide research support for businesses across the Northwest. Um, so we're a, a, an EU funded project using uh, European Regional Development Funds, part of the Northern Powerhouse uh, set up and it's um, providing a real injection of knowledge uh, for those businesses that perhaps don't have that resource in-house and to enable them to, to drive forward with business innovations that ultimately have a reduction in carbon emissions supporting transition to net zero. I'm Jack Brennan, a third year PhD researcher at the University of Cumbria and my PhD is in Geography, specifically peatland science. So for me it's all about bridging that gap between um, academia and business. This project's a win-win because we're providing new and innovative research into quite uh, an, an unexplored realm of, uh, of, of study. Um, and also the, the information and the data that I'm collecting can feed into the business and, and give the business competitive advantage because we're looking into what their work is actually doing beneath the subsurface which is something that isn't explored. Um, my name's Simon Carr and I'm uh, Associate Professor in Geography here in the, the Institute of Science and Environment and I'm a, a specialist in looking at the physical environment and understanding the, the nature of structure and function in environmental systems. So having an early career researcher such as Jack involved allows a project to have three to four years of focused work where the researcher is really delving into the depths of this particular project and, and my role then becomes the, the kind of the guide, the supervisor, someone who is able to start placing that research in a slightly wider context and framework. For me, and I think for many people within the university, we specialise in applied research. We specialise in looking at how the research that takes place within the university benefits the real world. And that's something that's quite unique. A lot of universities don't do that. If we genuinely want to use natural methods for you know, flood attenuation, flood management, climate mitigation. To do that, we've got to understand how and why those processes and interventions work. Because if we don't, we're just basically throwing everything into a black box and hoping that it'll work. I'm Jane Barker and I set up Barker and Bland Limited with my husband Simon Bland 27 years ago. We undertake peatland restoration and we have a trading arm known as Dalefoot Composts making compost from sheep's wool and bracken. I'm also a professor of practice at the University of Cumbria in the Institute of Science and the Environment. So there are always challenges in, in restoring any bog. There was always a very strong science element to our approach and on the couple of occasions where we've been allowed to do a design and build which means we come up with the, the restoration plan we've been able to take out some of the more um, considered more normal approaches for example using timber or using stone or other other mechanisms like a helicopter so we've been able to design out some of those very carbon intensive elements and use what's within the bog to restore the bog. We consider that it's a more appropriate ecologically, but it's also more appropriate economically. You get better value for money, which means that more bogs can be restored. Um, and it's, it's just a better win-win situation. So, the restoration that's being conducted along here um, is a really low carbon cost method to restore a blanket peatland. 
which is where you'd have once had really steep gully sides all along here, some of them even probably undercutting. Um, you would just get in massive amounts of peat erosion, massive amounts of carbon and methane release as well. And what's happened here is Barker and Bland have come through and they've reprofiled these gully sides to about a 33 degree angle. And then from local borrow pits and from any area within the excavator arm, They've taken small bits of vegetation turf from the tops and they've placed them along the sides, which then allows them to start growing and basically securing the peat in situ and kickstarting the process of carbon sequestration storage again in peatlands. But ultimately, across the UK, across, across the globe where we're conducting restoration, a lot of the sites still aren't acting as this, this really, you know, uh, intensive carbon store and carbon sequestration tool like peat should be functioning you know natural peat is fantastic but our restored peat still isn't reaching the levels of near natural peat My research is applying 3D X-ray computer tomography to peat samples uh, in the context of restoration for the first time. So it's, it's never really been investigated before how restoration bonds with underlying peat. So when we're talking about returving, um, how does it bond with the peat? How does it restore function? Um, another research has been finding that it can take up to 32 years for a bog to start sequestering more carbon than it's emitting post restoration. Um, so people are quite uh, anxious and a little bit worried about uh, implementing peatland restoration as a specific tool for the climate crisis because we really don't have that much left. 32 years is perhaps way too long. Um, so through my research, we can actually understand better how the restoration is working. And if there are ways we can increase the speed and increase that efficiency of the restoration work in capturing and locking in that carbon from the atmosphere. So I think early on when we started in the world of, of peatland restoration contracting, we quickly realised that there's no machinery actually built, purposefully built, to undertake this work in the sensitive way that is required. And of course that played into Simon's skills of deconstructing and reconstructing and understanding what was needed and, and what machine out there could we adapt because uh, these are very expensive pieces of kit. The thing about a small business is that it can be very responsive to opportunity, fleet of foot. And we actually ended up with a piece of machinery that could do something that nothing else had ever done in the world before, in a way that has led to enormous leaps forward in, in terms of, of restoration techniques. So we're looking at a machine here, right? It's, it's, made, it's made in Britain, it's got a very low footprint right but we actually make our own we modify our own machines so it's got a low ground pressure in this so we're talking about you know below one psi the critical thing about that is that you know we've got to be able to work over these very sensitive uh, environments without causing any damage to them so the restoration is a win-win situation but then we've been able to do it in a cost-effective way where we're not having to use expensive helicopters and fetching material from the other side of the world. The, the challenge is climate breakdown, um, environmental collapse, so it's huge. Um, and it's something that, you know, rightly so, an awful lot of people are working on. But there's no kind of superheroes within this. No one externally is just going to fix this problem. Everyone has a role to play. Um, and the challenge is, as I say, vast, but it's also quite, it was what's, what's described as a wicked problem in that it's hugely complex and there's 
interconnecting elements that have influence on one another. And within that, the solutions are also quite challenging and complex. So the approach that we can have by having a research-focused, data-led approach is we can, we can cut through a lot of that and we can make decisions based on fact, make it right and, and, and move forward at a, a greater pace than we could do otherwise. Because really we don't have time to get this wrong. You know, we don't have time for trial and error. The, the clock is certainly ticking in terms of climate breakdown. So we want to make sure we, whatever actions we do now, they're swift uh, and well thought out. So I am massively optimistic. Uh, I've been told that for, for many years. Um, but I think one big advantage about being on the peat bogs, and this is again something that I've, I've learned throughout my PhD journey, is there's such a beautiful environment. I'm really proud of the work that I'm producing. I've collaborated with so many wonderful people and been able to research in some state-of-the-art facilities, um, which I never thought I'd, I'd be doing. Um, but also this, this research gives hope. Um, I think it's, it's a pretty dark and depressing world when we start talking about climate change. And uh, I remember through, through Dr. Simon's Carl's lectures when I was an undergraduate, he always used to end with a slide of positive news. Um, which I think is really valuable and this project can one day be that, that positive news at the end of the slide. <laughs>